Hi, I'm Nigel Atherton. I'm the editor of Amateur Photographer magazine and today I'm talking about the Nikon ZF. I recently had the opportunity to visit Shanghai on a work trip and I spent a bit of time thinking about what camera I wanted to take with me and it took me about a nanosecond to decide I wanted to take the Nikon ZF because as soon as this camera was announced uh, late last year I realised that this was a camera I've been waiting for for a very long time and I just wanted to have an opportunity to have a play with it and to shoot with it. For a bit of context, to go back a little bit, I started using Nikon in the early 1980s. I've been using them ever since. I started out with cameras like the FM2, uh, which is my camera, um, and the FA, and then I progressed to an F4S and an F8L1, and then DSLRs came out and I went with the D200, I think it was my first, D300, D700, D800, and currently um, shooting Z6 and Z7 mirrorless. But there's something about these cameras. These are great cameras. I have to say that all of the Nikon cameras I've owned have been great cameras, but they're not always very beautiful. And I think the mirrorless Z6 and Z7 are not the most beautiful cameras in the world. And in fact, really, since the 90s, Nikon has kind of lost that, that flair, that ability to produce a camera which you look at and go, wow, that's a beautiful camera. That's really lovely to look at. So of course, recently they realized that uh, there's a lot of affection for these, this style of camera. And they've had a couple of attempts at bringing out a retro version, not entirely successful. Finally, with the ZF, I think they kind of nailed it, almost nailed it, or they got as close as they've ever got before. So having spent a few days with it, I'm gonna take you through what I think of the camera. Now, the first thing you notice when you pick up the ZF is how heavy it is. It's heavier than you think it's gonna be. I don't know why. I, well, I do know why. It's because it's solid magnesium alloy body, weather sealed, it's got brass dials. It's a really well-built, professional build quality type camera but you really feel that when you pick it up. And I've been shooting with the Z6 and Z7. It feels heavier than the Z6 and Z7. Sure enough, when you weigh it, it actually is heavier than the Z6. It's only by about 50 grams, but it feels like the difference is more than 50 grams. And that's because whereas the regular Z6, Z7, Z8 have a really decent sized grip to pick the camera up and you can hold it one-handed and you can shoot one-handed. The ZF doesn't. Um, and because it's heavy and because it's quite wide, you feel like you never feel like you've got a quite a good secure. I wouldn't lean over a tall building with this without a strap on um, with this camera because I just don't ever feel like I've completely got it in my hand, unlike a camera like this. Um, luckily, there's a very easy fix for that. And that is for about 35, 40 pounds, there's the small rig grip, which if anyone's gonna buy this camera, I think this is an absolutely essential purchase because it just completely transforms the way that the camera handles. It screws on the bottom and gives you that grip that you're missing. And with the grip on, it's a completely different beast. I think if you're just using, at the moment, I've got it on with a 40 millimeter F2 lens, which is one of only two retro style lenses that Nikon have brought out to go with this camera. Um, and if you're using a small lens, you can get away with it maybe without the grip. But I, when I went to Shanghai, I took the 24 to 120, and there's, it's quite uncomfortable holding a, this camera without a grip with this lens on it. So step one, buy the grip. Now because of its price, around 2,000 pounds, people might think that it's effectively a reskinned version of the Z6 II. This is the Z6 I, but I don't have the Z6 Mark II. But some people might think it's just a reskinned version but it isn't, it's actually a lot more than that. It's more like a Z6 Mark III, because what it's done, it's taken some of the features from the Z8, which was released earlier in the year, and added them to this. And it's also added a few extra features as well that the Z8 doesn't even have. Um, it has the same processor, the XSpeed 7 processor uh, from the Z8, and it has the subject detect autofocus system from the Z8. And the Z8, if you remember, is a scaled down version of the Z9. So we're talking a couple of years ago, Nikon's flagship five and a half grand camera, which has been effectively condensed down into the 4,000 pound Z8. And this has probably 75% of what the Z8 has. So for the money, you're getting a lot of technology in the camera. It's an incredibly good value proposition. What it doesn't have is the sensor from the Z8. It has the 24 megapixel sensor from the Z6 II. It's been tweaked a little bit. Um, but obviously it has the, the XP7 processor to go with it. 
but I think I don't personally need any more than 24 megapixels. If I've got them, it's fine, it's a bonus, but really it just fills up my hard drive a lot quicker. Obviously, the ZF is not the only retro styled camera on the market because the elephant in the room is the Fujifilm X-T5 and Fujifilm have been doing retro a lot longer. This is the fifth generation X-T and they've kind of perfected it. The same sort of style of shooting as the ZF, but there are some key differences. Obviously, I'll do a separate video talking about that in more detail, but the key thing, of course, is this is a full frame and the, the Fujifilm is APS-C. So let's, for now, just clear these other cameras out of the way so that we can create more space to look at the ZF. If you look on the top plate, you can see that it has all the traditional dials that you expect to see on a retro type camera or on an original 35 millimeter camera. You've got your shutter speed dial, you've got ISO dial, you've got exposure compensation on here. But over on the left here, you've got your PASM switch, which you'd expect to see on more modern DSLR type cameras. So you've kind of got the best of both worlds if you really can't let go of this way of shooting, it's there too. And you've got your, of course, your front and rear input dials on the front and back of the camera. Now on the back, controversially, Nikon has opted not to go with the tilt LCD screen that it has on the Z6 and Z7 and the Z8, which tilts both vertically and horizontally. But they've gone with the fully articulated swing out LCD type screen. Now this is an odd choice because although this type of screen is much better choice for videography and especially if you want to video yourself if you're a vlogger, um, I don't see the ZF as a natural camera for videographers to, to choose. I'm not sure why you would choose a retro looking camera other than the fact it does look cool. But anyway, either way, they've included this tilt swivel screen. And I guess that does indicate the fact that Nikon has actually put quite a lot of quite high, relatively advanced video features on here. Now, as I'm gonna assume that if you're interested in a camera like this, it's because you like that retro style of shooting. So the first thing to point out is that you cannot fully replicate the style of shooting as you can with the FM2 because Nikon's uh, modern lenses don't have apertures. So you're still gonna to have to use the front control dial to input the apertures. Now there are a couple of ways around this. You can set in the uh, custom setup, the focus ring of this lens to be an aperture ring, but then of course you can't use it as a focus ring. But if you have one of the lenses in the Nikon range that has an additional control ring, such as their S-line lenses, like this 24 to 120 F4S, you can make this the aperture. And of course there's no click stops, but um, I don't really think that matters too much. And in fact, I set this to be my aperture and use this as the aperture on the, when I was using this lens. So you've got a pretty good retro experience, not quite like the FM2, because you don't have the physical apertures, but if you either use the control ring or the front dial, you've still got a, a fairly analog feeling experience to use. The problem I found is that I've been using DSLRs and mirrorless cameras for so long that I've got this muscle memory where I instinctively, in a hurry, reach for these front and rear dials with my finger. And when you do that, you can get yourself into a bit of a muddle if you haven't first made sure that the dials on the top are set in the right settings. For example, I've got the aperture set on the front and the shutter speed set on the back. Um, in order for the shutter speed dial to actually work on the back, you need to set the shutter speed dial on the top to this position called one third step. And when you put it in there, that effectively passes the control of the shutter speed from this dial to the back dial. If you haven't done that, as I found myself doing sometimes, and I was in, a, in some sort of manual shutter speed, I'd go to turn the, take a quick picture, go to flick the shutter speeds and nothing would happen. And I'd be thinking, why, why are the shutter speeds not changing? And then I'd remember, oh yeah, I've got this dial on the top, haven't I? Um, I think if I used it a lot after, if, after a week or two, I'd soon get used to it and I would be, my muscle memory would be relaxed and I'd overcome the fact that I keep instinctively using these dials instead of this dial. But I think if you are gonna shoot with the front and rear dials, you've gotta make sure that you set the shutter speed dial to this third step thing. The other problem, of course, is on the ISO dial. Now I've got no idea why Nikon puts the auto ISO control inside the menu. So you've got to like scroll down, press the ISO setting, go down, turn auto ISO on or off. It's a nuisance, frankly. And I don't know why they didn't just have an A setting on the ISO dial on the camera. So that if you wanted to go into auto ISO, you just put it in A and then you'd forget about it. Um, as it happens, what way it works is if you are in auto ISO and you've gone into the menu and set auto ISO, 
but you haven't set this ISO dial down to like say 100, it will only go down as far as what's on the dial. So if you've got say 1600 on the dial, the auto ISO won't go below 1600. And then there'd be times when I'm thinking, what's going on? My exposure compensation isn't working. Um, so what I'm getting at is when you switch between the old school way of working and the modern way of working, um, it's very easy to get mixed up and it's probably best to stick to one or the other, or at least have a slightly more organized brain than I have, or at least spend more time with the camera. So after a while you get used to uh, remembering to do these things, which and the two or three days that I had shooting with it, I never quite got to that point. It may look like an old camera, but it's full of really cutting edge tech. A lot of it, as I said, taken from the Z8, including the AF algorithms. All the focus on this camera is a definite step up from the Z6. It's faster, it's more precise. Um, but one thing that's missing, which I think is a real shame, is there's no um, toggle switch, no joystick for setting the AF point. So for example, doing street photography in Shanghai, I wanted to focus on a particular individual. Um, I had to use the D-pad on the back to choose the focus point, um, which is fine, it works, except that as a left eye shooter, I find that the my nose is on top of this uh, D-pad and I, and I find myself trying to try to, my nose and my thumb were trying to compete for the space. And I would really thought it would have been nicer to have had a joystick where it is on the, the Z6 and where it is on the Z8 over to one side and it's not quite in the way of my nose so much. The in-body image stabilization that's uh, on this camera is, is probably the best of any Nikon and I include the Z8 in that because it has a new feature which has been introduced on this camera for the first time and that is linking the in-body image stabilization to the focus point. So rather than the pivoting coming from the central axis of the sensor, by linking it to the focus point that it means that it can more accurately provide stabilization for what it is you're focused on. Um, it's very hard to measure that scientifically. I'm sure the scientific tests will be done, but I know I've found in experience that I was shooting down at a quarter of a second handheld in low light and getting very sharp pictures. Our technical editor was shooting handheld at a second and getting very sharp pictures. So it certainly works very well. And I think it's been estimated that this technology adds about an extra stop of um, IBIS image stabilization compared to the other systems in used in Nikon's other cameras. There's another cool feature which is unique to the ZF, which is a dedicated black and white position on the switch, which is on the collar underneath the shutter speed dial. And even though this black and white setting may really just be a shortcut to the black and white mode, and you could also reach it just by going into the picture control and selecting monochrome. It is quite nice to have it on the dial as a very, very quick way in. Now when you select black and white mode, there are two different uh, picture styles for monochrome. One is a flat monochrome, which is designed for um, editing work, I guess, afterwards. And the other is a deep tone monochrome, which is a much punchier, high contrast one. And that's the one I prefer to use for my shooting because I don't want to have to do all the editing afterwards. I need to talk about card slots because Nikon's made a fairly odd choice with the ZF, which has raised a lot of eyebrows. Now, when it brought out the Z6 and Z7, it introduced um, CF Express, which is an expensive card slot. And I was a little bit annoyed that I had to go and fork out loads of money for these really expensive cards. Um, but I've got them now, so that's fine. And I use them in the Z6 and the Z7. The Z8 takes a uh, CF Express and it's also added SD card slot. The Z6 II, of course, has also um, a CF Express and an ST card slot. So you kind of expect the ZF to do the same, but it hasn't. They've gone with an SD card and a micro SD card, which is a little odd. It's kind of irritating because now I've got these really expensive CF Express cards that I can't use in this camera. So that's one thing. But ignoring that, I also do have a big collection of SD and micro SD cards too. So I'm kind of curious why they did that. I think perhaps um, when you take a look inside, the other thing about this is that to get the well, you can take the SD card out, no problem. But to get the micro SD card out, you've got to take the battery out first. So it clearly isn't intended that you're going to be swapping and changing micro SD cards on a regular basis. It's fairly obvious, I think, that Nikon intend the micro SD card just to sit in the camera and never be taken out and just be a backup, an emergency backup, and you'll use the SD card as your main card slot. And I think that's fine for general still shooting. I think if you're a sports photographer, um, you're it's not ideal because it's the micro SD is not as high performance. But I think if you're a sports photographer, you're just not going to buy this camera anyway. It's not a high fast burst rate type of camera. Um, and I think if you're a videographer, again, it's 
Not ideal to have micro SD, but once again, I think it's probable that the person that buys this camera is not a videographer. But then I refer you back to the, L the Tilt and Swivel LCD screen, but that's another story. Either way, you've got a choice of, well, you've got both an SD and a micro SD. For, for reasons best known to myself, I decided I was gonna put raw files on my SD and JPEGs on my micro SD. And because I was in Shanghai, I wanted to back up my JPEGs to my Dropbox every night just so I had something. It meant I had to take the battery out to get the micro SD card out and fiddle around to do that every night. Not really a big deal though, um, and it certainly isn't a deal breaker. The important thing is it does have two card slots because I think nowadays having just one card slot is something that would uh, put me off buying a camera, I think. While I've got the uh, card slot open, it's just worth drawing attention to the battery, which is the same battery as used in the uh, other Z series cameras. Um, it's rated for 380 shots, which is not that high. In practice, I found that although I took a spare battery, I never needed to use it, um, but I'm not really a, a, a spray and pray type of shooter anyway, but I found one battery lasting me a day. And what I really like is the fact that it's got USB charging, so I didn't have to bother taking a separate battery charger. Um, picture quality is fantastic, as you'd expect from a Nikon. I think the picture quality from pretty much any modern mirrorless camera is fantastic. I've long ago stopped worrying about um, what the image quality is like because it's more than I need and I think all cameras are more than I need. It, no doubt that the ZF is equally just as good as anything else I've used. I probably would have got the same pictures on a different camera. It's probable that I might not have enjoyed using the camera as much because there is something really nice about the ZF to hold and to use. I really enjoyed the shooting experience. I find that uh, using a camera like this in Shanghai made me stick out like a sore thumb a little bit. I only saw half a dozen cameras the entire time I was there. There was a lot of people taking pictures on phones. Everyone was taking pictures on phones all the time. Not so much cameras. And maybe it's because I'm a Western tourist as well. I stuck out like a sore thumb, especially when I had the 24 to 120 fitted. I found that if I put that on, they see me come in basically, and any hope of getting any kind of candid shots was out the window. Luckily, I also took with me the 26 mm 2.8 pancake, which is Nikon's smallest full frame um, lens. And by putting this on, I was a little bit more discreet and a little bit more uh, invisible, which was quite handy. The ZF does have a really nice shutter sound. It's not that loud and it feels really good, um, but of course you can hear it. So I did find when I was doing street photography, um, I decided to set the record button to be uh, a silent shutter. It switched me in and out of silent shutter mode. So if I wanted to be super discreet, I could just press that button and um, be completely silent. So in conclusion, the ZF is a beautiful camera, it looks great. Uh, it handles very well too if you put the grip on it. Without the grip, perhaps not so much, but with the grip on, it handles really well. The focusing is really good, the image stabilization is really good. Um, it has some great features on it. It's fun to use. Um, and for the money, you're getting a hell of a lot of features. When you consider this is half the price of the Z8, and for me, it's got more than half of the features that the Z8 has probably three quarters of the features the Z8 has, and the ones that the Z8 has that this doesn't have, I'm not that particularly bothered about. So I would probably rather buy this and a couple of nice lenses than the Z8. Having said that, it's not perfect, of course, no camera is. It is quite a big, heavy camera. Um, I think that comes with the build quality. If you want the build quality, you've got to put up with the weight. So, and I do, I've always been moaning about the build quality on the ZFC. So I can't really complain about this being a bigger, heavier camera. Having said that, when you're carrying it around all day, it is a quite a substantial camera. Um, if you're in the market for a retro style camera and you don't have any camera and you, you, you've got the whole market open to you, it is worth looking at the Fujifilm X-T5, which is considerably smaller and lighter, but it's APS-C. So then you have to ask yourself, do you really need full frame? Do you want full frame? There are obviously certain benefits to full frame, which you probably uh, already know about. So I think if you do want full frame, um, then the ZF is the obvious choice. If you are already a Nikon user and you're looking to upgrade from a DSLR or very early mirrorless camera, then the ZF is an obvious choice. Finally, one big reason for choosing the ZF is if you are a Nikon user and you have a big collection of Nikon glass, or you have the interest in buying old Nikon glass on eBay and so forth is that when you put old lenses on this camera, they are transformed in how easy they are to you to focus manually using the subject detection technology, which is in this camera. So from a Nikon point of view, 
uh, a Nikon existing user point of view, the ZF is the best Nikon probably you can buy. And really, the, the little things that I found irritating, which were more about the sort of getting mixed up with my dials, would soon be fixed if I had it for long enough and was able to spend a couple of weeks shooting with it. And I think I would soon get used to where things were and, and, and how to use it well without getting, getting confused. So overall, Nikon have really produced a fantastic camera, which is going to appeal to a lot of people. Um, and I think it's going to be a huge success. Okay, so that's my short summary on the uh, Nikon ZF. I hope you found it interesting. Don't forget to uh, like the video if you enjoyed it. Comment below, let me know what you think of the Nikon ZF and do subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to know how it compares with the Fujifilm X-T5, do watch that video where I look at the two cameras side by side in a bit more depth. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.